Mr. Uh, John Hardy, our guest here on the program, he is a member of the House of Delegates, uh, a vice chair, in fact, a very important committee, and uh, also uh, currently a candidate for a county commission. Yes, good morning. Thank you guys for having me. And as John was saying there, we've just about completely flipped. We're 8812. Uh, 12 Democrats, and there is 13 seats over there, and the Speaker actually moved his seat over yeah. there. Uh, and he, and when he does leave the podium, if he wants to speak or if he wants to, to do something that he does not, uh, cannot do from the, from the podium, he will go over there, there and sit. So, uh, but yeah, it's been a complete role reversal, and uh, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm sure the uh, supermajority will continue for some time, and uh, we're already starting to see the. Uh, the woes that sometimes come with a supermajority. We're starting to see that a little bit in the House, but we'll just continue to work through that. John, you brought, uh, Steve brought me tomatoes. You have brought donuts. Well, I, I, you know, I didn't want to be outdone by Catlett, you know, and, and John, I heard John say he had a sleepless night, and mm-hmm. so I thought we'd get him some sugar in here. And, it and, did. And, it's and wonderful. Get him, get him fired up. <laughs> so. you, you, know, you notice one of those donuts is already missing. That would right. be the Doyle you, donut right there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know my wife is listening to this, so I just want to say I didn't have one. I turned down the opportunity for a donut. I yeah. did offer you a donut. You, did. you said, I, will, I, I don't need those, you said. That's right. John Gilstrap, such self-discipline. Yeah, well, I saw a number on the scale not too long ago. That <laughs> <laughs> it, just, the, it just has to change. He is the master of his domain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, John, uh, let's talk about uh, some things. We've been asking questions of uh, Republican. Yeah, that's right. We've got three Johns in the, in the room here. And that is the fire department fees uh, that... Right now, we got to figure out a better way to ratio these things around the state because uh, currently it's not being done in an equitable fashion for growth counties. Yeah, so quite a few things I want to talk about here this morning, and I really want to lead this off with this uh, volunteer fire department funding bill that was left on the table uh, last legislative session. We actually, the House... Uh, really could not come to terms with it and it bounced back and forth between the house and the senate and and uh, so you know we kind of kicked the can down the road um i was a uh, you know i worked on this bill a lot uh, trying to make it better uh did a, quite a few amendments to it in the finance uh committee um there was some floor amendments offered the bill is just bounced back and forward now uh, there's rumors that this bill is um gaining some ground and may come back uh, either in this special session or definitely probably back in the next session. But, you know, I just want everyone out there to be very careful and, and pay attention to how your legislators are voting on this bill, uh, especially here in the Eastern Panhandle in these growth in these growth counties, uh, because this is a very, very unfair funding formula that the uh, this bill is proposed. This bill is proposed to put a 0.45 percent uh, premium on your fire and casualty. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the bill started out with having some legs that people thought it was only going to be on your homeowners. Uh, you know, after some more investigating and working with some uh, the stakeholders, we found that, that this is going to also affect your vehicles, your commercial property, uh, your UTVs, your boats. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the areas, the growth counties are going to bear a very large brunt of this because our homes are valued at more, our insurance costs more. Um, the money is distributed out to the volunteer fire departments per fire department. There is no metrics in it. Uh, there's no evaluations in it for population, no evaluations in it for uh, calls run. Um, so it is uh, going to be very important that you pay close attention to this piece of legislation. For a two-year period during the time I was Deputy Secretary of Revenue, I was detailed by the Department of Revenue to work with the fire service to try and come up with a formula. And it's, it's, it, the fire service just, it, it, it just seemed like they were, it, it was impossible to persuade them to come up with some kind of a formula that was reasonably fair. They were just wedded to this idea. I don't, I don't care how big your fire department is or how small it is, you got to have the same amount of money. And I just thought that was crazy. Well, we continue to fight this in West Virginia, that one size fits all throughout the state. And, you know, this has been a common theme and a common problem, uh, you know, having a very centrally based government in Charleston. Uh, you know, one size fits all, the Eastern Panhandle, uh, you know, being the fastest growing county in the state of West Virginia, uh, you know, with I'm sure by the next census, we're going to surpass Charleston. Uh, you know, we, we are uh, our infrastructures is, is pushed to the max. We are continually to work on our water and route, uh, roads and and sewer and, and broadband. And this is just one more thing. And also in this bill, there's there's actually there's a funding 
uh, defunding mechanism that will take money away from fire departments that have paid firefighters. Yeah. So it's really does have, it has no benefits in it for, for Berkeley County. And uh, so I, I believe that we need to tread very lightly on this piece of legislation. Is this, is this to fund equipment or fire stations or salaries or, or all of the above? It is to fire, it is for equipment and training. And all we hear from the volunteer fire departments, and listen, I don't want to be the guy that comes out against volunteer fire departments. I understand volunteer fire departments are very, very important. Important. They are hubs of the community, especially in some of these rural communities. And, and understand that they these rural communities need to have their fire departments. But what we hear from the fire departments is they don't have any people. You know, so the people, they don't have volunteers. They don't have people to man the stations. We're going to give them money for equipment and for training. But I think it's one of those things that we're just kind of standing back and, you know, I call it the Rockefeller rule. We just stand back and throw money at a problem instead of trying to get to the root of the problem. Is there a state fire commission of some sort? There is. Mm -hmm. There is. We're in, and the various departments can get together and, and match heads about what the needs are. Yes, and they have associations that represent them. And But like John said, they are just so stuck on this mm -hmm. one you know, area of all fire departments are funded the same, whether you run, let's say you're a very rural, you know, fire hall in a very small county and you run, you know, 30 calls a week where you may have a fire hall here in Berkeley County who may run 300 calls a week. So there's, there's a huge difference in the, 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 the amount of calls run, the population that is served and the wear and tear on the equipment. Um, you know, th those are the differences that have to be addressed. Yeah. Well, I don't, I, you know, I've got, some considerable experience in, in, in this. And, you know, rural departments, and I don't really, we, we, the specifics are light in all of this, so I'm not really sure what we're talking about, but rural departments have longer run times, which means their fires tend to be bigger by the time you get there, and they don't have water. So tankers are expensive. Training for tanker operations are, are complicated and, and, and need to be replicated on, on, on a continuing basis. It's much more complicated than running a fire in um, Berkeley County where you hook up to a hydrant and you know it's kind of a, a classic firefighting operation. So there are arguments to be made that, that rural counties need to have significant funds as well as the the, the other side. And again, the, I don't know what John the specifics John you're here. absolutely right about that, but there's a way to handle it. You have a base that takes care of all of the rural ones. Mm -hmm. And then what you have is another pot of money that gives money to the more highly populated areas f for their needs over and above those of, uh, of, 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 of the basic service. Yeah. I, that makes sense, John well, yeah, and another, But another layer to this is you have counties like Berkeley County who we pay a fire fee and an ambulance fee, and those those fees are just to keep that stuff on the road. And then, you know, you're also going to get billed for your ambulance fee if you are using the ambulance. But you have counties that right now are not paying any ambulance fees or any fire fees. Their county commissions do not have the political willpower to install these in their mm -hmm. counties, and they want counties like Berkeley County to, to subsidize them. And as, as a representative of the taxpayers, this is just not fair to Berkeley County taxpayers. That's right. And incidentally, John, John Hardy, uh, I think you might be a little bit fast on when Berkeley County overtakes Kanawha in population. Berkeley, the, the last two censuses, has grown about 20,000 people each time. I think it'll grow more than that between now and the next census. So it's up to about 120,000 now. I expect it to be somewhere between 140 and 150 by 2030. Kanawha County is about 190. I think it will probably drop to about 180. Uh, maybe 175 by 2030. So I think the time that Berkeley catches it is in the 2040 census. Well, and I, and I know that a lot of people there in Charleston are moving out to that Tays Valley area. That Tays Valley area is really starting yeah. to grow down Well, there, Putnam so. County is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, people from Charleston are moving west, and people from Huntington are moving east. It's, it's just they're moving around, and that's the county between the two. Yeah. Now look at John Hardy, our guest here on the uh, program. So, John, what do you think feasibly can get passed in this House of Delegates? Well, you know, I'm concerned that the bill in its in its current construction uh, is gaining some steam. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, we are able to uh, right the ship, and if this does come up in our special session that we are uh, that's that we are talking about, nothing, there has been no call yet. Uh, the governor is still working on if there will be a call for us in our, to, to go into special session for our August interims. 
Uh, but if it is on that call, I don't think there's any reason to rush this. I think that this legislation needs more work. I think it needs more time, and I think there's no reason for us not to address this in our January uh, regular session. John Hardy, if you're done, may I move to another issue? Sure. Or, okay. Corrections. Uh, I mean, speaking of a special session, there have been rumors of a special session regarding corrections. Uh, corrections right now in West Virginia is a royal mess, uh, as is the state police. What, a, do you think there will be a special session to deal with the, 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 the shortage of corrections officers? And B, if so, how do you think it might be resolved? Well, I will tell you, John, um, I spent two hours last night on a call. Uh, I, and I can't discuss the, the, um, the, you know, the details of that call. But I can tell you that there are lots of different proposals out there for corrections. I think that you are going to see probably eight to ten pieces of legislation okay. that are going to be proposed. I do believe that there's going to be a special session. I don't know if all this legislation will pass, but there's there's lots of different um, approaches, and there has been done a phenomenal amount of hard work uh, put in by the House, uh, put in by the Senate, and by the governor's office, and also uh, okay. uh, corrections has been involved. Um, Secretary Sandy and, and his people have been involved. So I think that you will see a special session in August, and I think that you will see some legislation being passed to start to address this uh, okay. this, this problem. So, okay. Yeah. I, I will stay tuned. Well, and I, I really do think, as, as much as I said, I think that the this, this firefighter bill should maybe be studied a little more and, and worked in the regular legislation, I really think that we need to try to get this – uh, jails and prisons legislation done because I think if we don't, it's going to dominate the se the early part of the session, and it's also it's leftover from last se last session. We've had all summer to study it and work on it, so I really think it's time to try to get this put to bed or at least start working on getting this taken okay. care of. John, I, I wonder if this is even a solvable problem, and I I ask that question because I saw a report yesterday that this country currently is short six hundred and fifty thousand construction workers. Uh, teachers, we're short in the state every year and have been even before there was a problem with it. Now it's just a worse problem. And I wonder if this is just a symptom of even the larger problems in the country where there's just a lot of help wanted signs that are out there and, and very few opportunities to fill them. So maybe we need to have the entire state rethink the entire incarceration structure of, in West Virginia. Does every county have a day report center, for instance? Are there, are there jails where we're housing people that are nonviolent and could be housed in a different way. Uh, detention at home, for instance. Uh, we maybe need to rethink the whole thing because there may not be a cavalry of corrections workers ready to rush in just because we raised pay. Well, Rob, I think you're you're talking and thinking the way that the legislature is, is looking. We are, you know, it's like eating an elephant. You have to start somewhere, one bite at a time. <laughs> we are, you know, we're at least starting to address that we know that there is a major issue in West Virginia in our corrections with our pay structures, with our retirement. Uh, we know that other states are having these major um, shortages as well, uh, but I believe you have to start somewheres, and I believe that you will see some legislation put in place for uh, trying to change some of the bail structures, the pre-bail, uh, uh, the pre-trial pre bail, uh, also some different ways of uh, incarcerating, making sure counties are uh, working to implement day report centers, drug courts, uh, diversionary um, uh, types of programs for nonviolent uh, people, you know, like you say, uh, we have to lock up the people we're afraid of, not the ones we're mad at. Um, so, so I think you're going to see a lot of expansion in that. Are you hearing enough momentum among your colleagues to believe that this is a course of action that'll be followed? I think that there is a huge uh, number of people in the legislature that are ready to act. Uh, on corrections. Uh, you know, uh, Mike Height put together an, or, uh, a group of us and we went out to the East, Eastern Regional Jail and spent about three or four hours out there, had a wonderful tour, was able to understand, um, you know, exactly what they are, are seeing out there and the problems that they're having, seeing with the National Guard uh, what they're doing there in a non-contact type positions, but seeing how uh, they're being utilized. And, and I think that uh, the legislature, at least from the House side, um, is really ready to react and do something. And I do believe that our Senate colleagues are on, on pace with us. You are the vice chair of finance. There are universities in this state that are experiencing financial issues. Do you feel an urgency to assist those universities financially in this state and the colleges, or are they on their own at this point? Well, 
I do not feel that there is something that we need to, to react to right now. I know that you are probably talking about a certain school uh, that is in dire straits right now. And uh, I was uh, wondering if there was going to be something on the call um, about some type of maybe a bailout type program or something for that school. Uh, I haven't seen or heard of anything about that yet. Um, you know, if there's something that we can do for a institution in the short term to maybe get them back on their feet, I think that's something the legislature may have some appetite for. But when they are as in as deep as they are now and not really a way out, are we really just going to be furthering that problem for that school a year or two years down the road? Do we have a um, uh, responsibility to the students that are there now to try to find them someplace where they can finish out their college careers uh, with stability? So I, I don't think that there's any proposed legislation for an immediate bailout because it, it would take a phenomenal amount of money, probably 15 to $20 million dollars. Uh, to be able to bail out that institution. So I, I don't think there's any appetite for that right now. But uh. John, before you go, I know you're thinking about Aldous and Broadus as the school is referring to, but of course we know WVU reported a much larger deficit. Shepherd recently, I believe the figure there was $3 million, and they're closing, they're, both, they're proposing to close the Martinsburg Center uh, here. Uh, no, they're closing it. You, well, it's I, final. It's a final decision. Final? Well, I know it's, December 31st. Well, well, I thought that was the recommendation that she was Mary Hendricks was going to make to the Board of Governors at the September 14 meeting, though, uh, John. Uh, 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 that is correct. So it's not a and formality, my, no, is it? It is my understanding that the Board of Governors they will vote, but will they, vote but they can't close. vote till September 14. Oh, okay. Right? That, that, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, I, I It is as good as done. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's cost the school three hundred thousand dollars a year for a loss leader, and they and with a three million dollar shortfall, they can't afford it. And incidentally, in terms of of Alderson Broadus, I would not advocate any kind of a bailout there. That's a private school. Uh, it is the responsibility of the legislature to fund the public colleges and universities in the state, not to fund the private colleges. Um, I think that that uh, all the public colleges and universities, each one of them is to some degree in a shortfall. Uh, it, the, the, the problem at West Virginia University is, is seriously acute. And, and I suspect there it is in part because of, 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 of some not very good management. I don't think that's true at most of the other institutions because in terms of a percentage of a shortfall, they aren't nearly as bad off as WVU is. But I do think that there is a problem system-wide that the legislature needs to deal with. Well, I, I will tell you that, you know, we have known for some time that there was this higher ed cliff coming. We knew that there was a loss in population of that age of people who were going to be going to four-year institutions. Uh, I think that COVID has exacerbated this. Uh, people, uh, students have learned that they do not need to go to a school to get an education. They can do more stuff online. I think with the two-year schools doing a very good job with uh, – uh, training and programs and certificates that that has cut into some of the four-year institutions also so I think we knew this cliff was coming I think it was just maybe moved forward a few years that's kind of caught the schools off guard due to COVID. Well John you're a businessman if you are if you see that there's there's a cliff coming for your business and and you've got time to work it you make changes in your business and your in your plans and in your staffing and everything else to try to forestall the, the 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 cliff or hopefully to just walk away from it. Why don't we hold public institutions to the same standard? I mean, if it's I'm as a taxpayer, but I'm also a huge proponent of of education uh, and public education. But it seems to me, rather than throwing money at the problem, you say, well, what what programs don't students want to attend, and then you cut those programs. And then in the future, if there's a new demand for those programs, you bring them back. Well, I think you are starting to see that the higher eds are starting to, to start that uh, process right now. They're going back in and they're evaluating what programs they're offering, what those programs, uh, how many students they're generating, how many students they're graduating, uh, what it costs to run those programs. Are they? So I think you're really starting to see higher ed start that process now. I think that they really thought they had another cushion, another couple years, 
down the road before this was going to hit. And I think with with COVID and so many students deciding to go online, uh, not going to four year institutions, getting these really nice certificates and these training programs through James Rumsey and Blue Ridge CTC, who who, who does a wonderful job, a wonderful job of training people uh, for jobs that are in our area. And I just think that you're starting to see the repercussions of that. And I think you're going to start seeing these public and private institutions take really hard looks at their budgets and, and the programs that they are running. But so. the, the public institutions get significant portions of their funding from the state. And so it is up to the governor and the legislature to determine what that is. Uh, we have, uh, if, uh, if I'm the president of a, of a public college or university, and I see the cliff coming, and I go to the governor or the, or the, uh, the chair of the finance committees uh, and say, listen, I see this cliff coming. What can we do? Uh, I, th- I believe West, every state over the last 15 years has cut funding for higher education, dollar per student. West Virginia has cut it a lot more in terms of percentage than most other states have. Now, the last couple of years, the legislature has begun to add some back into it. I don't think that's enough. So, yes, I think, John Gilstrap, I do think we should hold the heads of those institutions accountable. But at the same time, if we look at it and say, we're just not going to give you enough money, then, then it isn't all on them. Okay, uh, John, a minute left. Final word is yours. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, just uh, talk about a few things that I'm going to be working on this legislative session. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm really concerned about is uh, trying to get some one-time funding for our courts. So we have our growth counties where we've added these magistrates and now we've added these new circuits and our county commissions have to supply the courtroom space for these. Uh, and they're finding it very difficult to come up with the extra funds to be able to uh, build these new courtrooms. I think Berkeley County needs something like $14 million to be able to uh, develop these new courts. So I'm hoping maybe to try some maybe some one-time funding from the state uh, for these growth counties, the counties that are adding these magistrates, the counties that are adding these circuit courts. Obviously, I'm a huge proponent of the magistrate courts. I believe that is the very uh, essence and the very beginning of anyone's uh, uh, right to freedom and, and being able to access the court system. So we're going to work for that. Uh, also have a piece of legislation I'm going to work on to try to get some more SRO funding through the uh, school funding formula. And then next week, uh, if I'm home in time from our special session, if that does happen, I will be at the uh, Berkeley County Fair, and I will be shamelessly promoting my <laughs> campaign for Berkeley County Commission. And I've had these nice uh, T-shirts made up here. It says by John Hardy for Berkeley County Commission. And they will be available. I have some of those at the uh, booth at the uh, county fair. Stop by and see me and talk to me about the uh, issues you see in Berkeley County. All right. I just got a text from Mike Cornby. He said that'll be uh, thirty-seven fifty for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> John, good to see you again, man. Thank you guys very much. Delegate John Hardy, and uh, he soon would like to be known as Commissioner John Hardy, too. It is uh, 933.